everyone, Spike here. Uh, it is 3.30 in the morning. Uh, I'm about to get ready to get to the airport so that we can go to Midwest Fur Fest. Um, but before I head over there, I just want to show you, I got a new car. Um, I've had my previous one for like, um, plus eight, nine years now. Um, yeah, let's take a look at this. This is awesome. This is a Chevy Cruze Eco. Um, this is a 2012 edition. Yeah. Yeah, right now I got um, temporary tags on it, so um, I'll uh, hope to get that ready. And here is the one thing I, I like about this car. Let me get this ready. Remote start. And now I just gotta unlock it so I can get in. Yeah, so let me put this in. Let turn it out. Let's get a little cold in here. So yeah, uh, what I like about this one is that um, it uh, tells me uh, my gas mileage, uh, how far I got to before I have to fill up on gas. Um, let's see, I even got XM radio. Let's see, it's got all the bells and whistles in here. So, I am um, about to head over to the airport and I will see you guys in Chicago. train. There's our hotel. Yeah, I just gotta have a short walk. I like trains. <laughs> hey, go look that one up. You'll get it. Dragon, are you? Uh oh. Oh well, at least it gives people a reason to touch me. Oh. Badges. Yeah, we touch each other all the time. It's a calm thing. What? Oh wait, I'm not meant to say that. I mean, we're innocent. We're all innocent. Oh, Quimby. <laughs> I'm still trying to think of something to say. Uh, uh, you wanna play? <laughs> and photo bomb in three. I'm kidding. <laughs> She'd kill me. I'm one. Watch. What? Want to go? Want to go? Okay. Uh. Hey everyone, uh, registration has just started, uh, so I got my um, 
my badge here. And uh, I also got this year's uh, programming guide. Uh, definitely uh, keeping with the theme, we have a Pirates theme this year. Yeah, I, I, I love the front cover. And uh, it's got the explanations on the uh, events, got the schedule, everything. Um, so we're here at the Red Bar, one of my favorite places to go to uh, during the night time. Um, they made some uh, special uh, uh, furry drinks uh, for us. Uh, they made three different ones. Uh, we have Hal at the Moon, which is vodka, peach snaps, uh, sweet and sour mix, uh, grenadine, and uh, Sierra Mist. Uh, there's also Paul Prince, which is bourbon, orange juice, lime juice, and blue curacao. The one I got here is called Eye of the Tiger. What this is is coconut rum, uh, triple sec, cranberry juice, and blue curacao. So I'm going to give this a try and see how it is. You can definitely taste the coconut in there. You love I like this one. Um, yeah, I, I think they're trying to get uh, into um, more of a tropical theme along with this, um, since we are with a pirate scene. Um, uh, coconut rum, that, that definitely uh, fits into it. Um, as far as the schedule tonight, um, not much is going on. All we got is um, the Thursday night uh, RS Alley, Tabletop Gaming, Fursuit, um, uh, Furfest Lounge. Um, uh, it was that close to saying, uh, Fursuit Lounge. Um, then they have something called Pirates Cove, which uh, I am not exactly sure what that is. So um, let me see if I can uh, look it up and see. Uh, yeah, I uh, have absolutely no idea what that is. So um, oh, yeah, that's pretty much um, what we got right now. Uh, I'm going to enjoy my um, enjoy my drink here. Uh, I'll see you guys a little later. this 
suit in a while. Her this year's first attorney winner telephone. How are you? Go ahead. How are you? Hi, I'll ask you later. Hi, guys. after the show. We've been here since two in the morning. Uh, not quite. Well, no, like, not two in the morning. Well, like I've been here since two in the morning. I got, I got into Chicago. But two in the morning. What, what, what is possibly in demand? I should say you? I've been here for two hours since this morning. <laughs> I got those words mixed around. Yeah. What could possibly be in demand for you to be here sleep causes for that extra long? Dyslexia. I'm number three, so I'm here early enough, right? So. It's the Furries Black Friday. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Every convention's like that. It's worse than Anthrocon. Anthrocon is the worst. You have to be there like... That's why I got here two hours early. Seven or eight a.m. Sometimes six, depending on the day. Well, I would, I would get, I would get there like, uh, I normally get there about two hours early. Then I'm in there early enough to get most of the people. I like what they did this year. I wasn't here this year. What they went did at Anthrocon this year? The, the sponsor and above. Had a separate and early entrance line to dealers, uh, and because those people were very intent on privilege, they were definitely not messing around and trying to trying to push in them in front of each other. Yeah, you know, I that's almost enough for me to spend the extra money. It was for me, and that's <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure I like that. But you know, was only, number one, it was only like 10, 15 minutes. It's still enough. Oh yeah. Yeah, this is where the dealers are in this Advertising that it can cure a wide variety of unrelated conditions. Beware. That's a lie. Here we have something, this natural force out there. It'll treat gout, rheumatism, arthritis, neuralgia, sciatica, tabby's dorsalis, my favorite, catar of the antrum, I hate when that happens, arteriosclerosis, <laughs> diabetes, glycosuria, nephritis. These are a wide variety of conditions that have nothing to do with each other. Some of them are caused by a bacterial or viral infection. 
Others are caused by the buildup of chemical deposits in the body. You cannot have a single cure that is going to affect the mechanism of all these things. But people ate this up. They honestly believed it in the early part of the 20th century. What was this miraculous force of nature? What indeed was this amazing thing that can cure all human diseases? Nothing short of the healing powers of radioactivity. <laughs> I'm not making this up either. This is an actual ad from 1911. They believed, oh, radioactivity, it's new, we just discovered it. They used to think x-rays could be used to cure the gout, the dropsy, the, the croup, you know, Qatar of the Antrim. I hate having Qatar of the Antrim. Uh, some of you might have seen these in, in antique stores or in your science class, the Revigator. It was lined with radium ore. In some cases, it was actually lined with uranium ore. Uh, basically, you were to put the water into it and make the water radioactive, and then you were to drink it. Oh. Okay. Today, we say that, oh, what a terrible thing, but look at the wording here. You know, as described in Dr. Soberman's lecture before the Rentgen Society, printed in this number of the archives. How sciencey sounding! That is crap! But they are dressing it up like science and trying to sell it to people. That's what I get pissed off about. And the reason I'm up here today is because there's a lot of furries out there I've spoken to tend to be susceptible to this sort of stuff. And if I can tell one person in here that your amazing copper bracelet that you think is making your carpal tunnel go away is not, I will feel good. And then there's always a person who says, what about the placebo effect? The placebo effect is a known and measurable effect. It has been studied. The placebo effect is limited to pain. You can fool your body into feeling less pain if you think that you have been given a powerful painkiller. The placebo effect only works on pain. It doesn't work on a gushing artery. <laughs> oh, here. I'll, I'll put this yellow crystal next to you. That'll make the blood stop. <laughs> Remember that. Nothing cures multiple conditions. Mankind has been looking for what we call the panacea for thousands of years. That does not exist. The closest we have is in this glass in my hand. Mm. It does not cure, but after enough of it, you just don't give a damn. Just like Professor Marv Williams' exotic snake oils in 1885. Now, where pseudoscience is most employed is in the industry of human vanity. Is your hair getting thin? Is it falling out? Because human beings are very vain, especially when you start getting to be my age. The body is changing. Oh my God, my hair is falling out. I want to be young. I want to be strong. I, I want to be muscular. I want to be handsome. I want to have great sexual prowess, but I don't want to work for it. I want a magic pill that will make it happen. Well, here we have 1923, a scientifically accepted cure for baldness, the, uh, the thermo cap. It basically is this cone head you put on, and it, it generates heat, and the heat stimulates your scalp and makes the hair grow. It, to me, it looks like an execution device. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think it might well be. <clears throat> We go about 12 years or some number of years in the future, here, 15 years in the future, you can actually rent this model because they're very expensive, the Crossley Servac. Since people started to realize that heating up your scalp wasn't working, let's apply a vacuum to it. <laughs> it's a vacuum helmet. This man is wearing a vacuum helmet ostensibly to suck the hair out of his scalp. <laughs> actually, no. They go on with very sciencey words to explain that the vacuum draws blood to the surface, and the extra blood flow stimulates the follicles. Guess what? It doesn't. It just bruises your head. 
<laughs> but it sounds sciencey. Again, you're taking crap and you're dressing it up in the trappings of science. Is it any wonder why people in America today distrust science? Because they've been fed so much of this bullshit for so many years, they don't know what to believe anymore. Because here, in 1923, we had the thermocap. 1939, we had the vacuum helmet. Take us up to 2013, and we have the Theratome laser helmet. <laughs> you know what I say about mystical forces people don't really understand very well? Lasers, they must help. <laughs> this is the Theratome laser helmet, the first and only over-the-counter, FDA-cleared, wearable laser hair growth treatment on the market today. You probably can't read it, so I'll point out some of the features it has. Foam pads. That's nice. I like to have foam pads on my laser helmet. Charging pins. Oh, it's rechargeable. Um, Built-in speaker. I don't know. I haven't figured out what it's going to say to you. Proximity sensors. That's important. So what is coming? You look ridiculous. Take it off. <laughs> These things cannot stay on the shelf. They are selling like hotcakes with crack in them. <laughs> the Theratome laser helmet. Let me point something out. You see that phrase, FDA cleared? Oh, it's FDA cleared. That must mean it works, right? Oh, that's no. FDA cleared does not mean FDA approved. <clears throat> FDA cleared simply means they have looked at it, and they have deduced that when used properly, it will not kill you. That's all it means. If it was not FDA clear, the FDA would get it off the market because it is dangerous. It ain't doing nothing for you, but it doesn't hurt, so you can get FDA clearance. It's very, I need three hands. <sighs> now, here is another of my absolute favorite things that you see in advertising all the time. How many times have you seen this? Clinically tested, clinically tested, clinically tested, clinically tested. Oh, went too far. Here they come. Clinically tested, oh, that's great, they clinically tested it. What were the results of those tests? <laughs> we tested it! <laughs> clinically tested doesn't mean clinically proven. You occasionally will see clinically proven. Even that must be taken very, very skeptically. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I, I have food, which I, I'm still one. I need four arms up here. Cockroaches. <laughs> Ooh, big things. Of, I hope that's cheese. It's either cheese or butter. Stop. Um, butter. <laughs> No, no, it's cheese. Mm, behold, pepper cheese. All right. Look, we just have to do the I don't eat when I'm on stage. Hear me. Mm. Make some wine with that cheese. Mmm. Mmm. Nom, nom, nom. Where were we? Oh, yes. Here is the script that went along with the Theradrome laser helmet. <clears throat> It says, and I'll read it to you because, again, it's kind of small out there, I apologize. Hair loss might soon be a thing of the past, thanks to a group of presumably brilliant, including in natural science, or NASA scientists, people who have devoted their lives to the health of your hair follicles. Well, thank you fucking much for devoting your life to my hair follicles. <laughs> and it seems they might have actually found the cure for thinning locks. Enter the Theradrome laser helmet. And they go on, does it work? Apparently, it's been proven to grow new, healthy hair while doubling the follicle size of existing hair and slowing down or stopping hair loss. Clinical strength lasers, precisely tailored to maximize human hair growth, 20 minutes twice a week showed that hair began to regrow after 52 treatments. 52. Okay. That's six months. <laughs> you put this thing on some slub twice a week for six months? And it took you that long to see something happening? I think the guy just told you it was happening because he was getting tired of wearing it. Well, let's look at some of the wording. When you, I see these ads, I always look 
at the claims that they're making, and you should too. Don't get fooled by flowery language. Let's look and see what kind of flowery language we have. Hair loss might soon be a thing of the past. It seems they might have actually found the cure for thinning locks. Apparently it's been proven to grow new hair by presumably smart people. <laughs> <laughs> Just as I was finishing making the slide, I happened to notice something I hadn't seen before. All of a sudden, the Theradrome laser helmet is now FDA approved? That's a new one on me. What the hell? FDA approval usually means the FDA is kind of okay with this device. <clears throat> so I started doing a little bit of research. I looked in to the Theradrome laser helmet, and I found the actual statement of FDA approval, the basically form 501k. The 501k summary of safety and effectiveness. <clears throat> now, I want you to be very, very cautious when you look at the words here. The words of this document <clears throat> do not say it is effective. Here's what it says, and this is something these device manufacturers try to get away with. As a matter of fact, this is how most makers of generic medicines get away with selling generics with FDA approval. <clears throat> I don't take generic medicines. Yeah, that's another talk for another day, but I don't take them. Why? Because it's my job to test them, and I know what's in them. Okay, what are the claims being made? The claims are being made that my happy helmet here is substantially similar to this multi-million dollar prescription device that was, you know, developed for use in hospitals for people with androgenic alopecia, male pattern baldness. They actually do have a laser treatment. It is very expensive. It takes very, very specialized, highly expensive equipment. So these guys say that the happy helmet here it has the same intended use, it's for the same condition, it's designed to deliver treatment to the entire scalp just like the expensive one does. <clears throat> because of those three things, oh, I'm sorry, also has the same treatment schedule. Therefore, it is legally substantially equivalent. It's sort of like saying, you know, I have a Cadillac over here. And over here, I've got an old, beat-up Yugo from the 1980s. <laughs> you guys remember those? They are both designed to carry passengers. They are both designed to employ gasoline as a fuel. They are both set up to run on a highway system. According to the law, you can say that they are substantially equivalent. Are they? No. <laughs> nope. So, the happy helmet has no proof that it works. It's just, it looks like the expensive one, so it's FDA approved. <clears throat> Remember this guy? My favorite guy in the world. Oh. This man is actually a surgeon. He actually has a doctorate in medical degree. And, oh, I'm sorry, how'd that get in there? That must have slipped in from another slide. Uh, sorry, PowerPoint problem. We'll take care of that in the next presentation, okay? Anyway, uh, this guy, Dr. Oz, Dr. Mehmet Oz, he is seen on television. Okay, he's on the Dr. Phil show. That's your first clue. There's something strange about this. <laughs> This guy basically is trying to sell snake oil. He is using his apparently legitimate degree and credentials in medicine to try to sell people on useless crap. Garcinia Cambogia. I first saw an ad for Garcinia Cambogia a number of years ago, and it said that it was clinically proven. Clinically proven, it said. So, being a good scientist, I looked up the clinical study. 
where it was proven. They found out that if you took Garcinia Cambodia and fed it to overweight people, they would just start shedding pounds left and right, and they could eat anything they wanted to. They would still lose weight. What a miracle! This is what we've been looking for for so many years. I found on PubMed, the National Library of Medicine search engine, the first two references. One was a reference to the study. The study was conducted in Cameroon. Mm, okay. It was conducted on exactly eight patients. Just eight? And it's not a very large sample size. It's kind of hard to draw sweeping conclusions. The second reference was a paper denouncing the first study as fundamentally flawed. What? And essentially saying you cannot draw any conclusion from that study. Did Dr. Oz bother with that? Oh, no, no, no. He's still selling the Garcinia Cambogia. It's some nut that grows on a tree. Uh, no, I, I'm not Dr. Oz. I mean the Garcinia. Okay. It's some nut that grows on a tree. Here's what he says. It behaves as an appetite suppressant. It increases the levels of serotonin in the body naturally. Oh, it does? Then why aren't you marketing it as an antidepressant? You know, you start screwing with the serotonin levels in your brain, yeah, that's something that requires very, very delicate work. <clears throat> you don't just start giving people serotonin uptake blockers willy-nilly and just sending them home. Okay, that's the first claim he makes. Notice he's using science -y sounding words. We used to call this double talk. Oh, listen to my science -y sounding words. I will convince you with them. <clears throat> Here's how he says it works. It blocks the enzyme citrate lyase that provides instructions to the body to create fats from the carbohydrates. So, while you take in carbohydrates, it blocks the body's signal to convert those carbohydrates to fat. That's the magic diet pill people have been dreaming about for years. <clears throat> Very recently I found another reference in the medical literature to this Garcinia Cambogia. And I was fascinated by the conclusion they came up with. Does it work? Yes, it does. It will make you lose weight. It also causes hepatic fibrosis, inflammation, and oxidative stress. Very dangerous conditions. That's how it works. You too can lose weight, just get leukemia. <laughs> Shit on wounded pounds with the AIDS diet plan. There used to be something called that, remember that? Yeah, the AIDS diet plan, they kind of had to change that name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what it's called now, probably something dumb. <sighs> now this is what pissed me off. This stuff, okay, maybe it'll make you lose weight, but it is going to induce rather nasty side effects. And this so-called Dr. Mehmet Oz is hawking this stuff on television? Knowing that it can have potentially toxic side effects, knowing against his Hippocratic oath that it could hurt or kill people, unless he knows deep in his black little heart that those pills actually don't contain any Garcinia Cambogia at all. Most of these supplements that you see, most of these miracle pills, have nothing in them. Oh, they claim that they do. But I could make all sorts of claims. I could claim I got a 20-inch dick out there. It doesn't make it true, sadly. <laughs> However, that is something that is both measurable and provable. <laughs> Later. <laughs> if it is too good to be true, it is not. Anything that says miracle, anything that says breakthrough, anything that's like, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing we've looked for, it is not true. It is either out and out fabrication or somebody just getting a little too excited with themselves. Uh, he had a, a brilliant pink and yellow fursuit. In his non-fursuit life, what he did for a living was he was an emergency medical technician. He was an ambulance attendant, and his job was to save people's lives. He was returning from an ambulance call when 
A tragic accident. A driver in Indianapolis ran a red light having missed the signal, uh, broadsided the ambulance, knocked it over, both Lemonade Coyote, whose real name was Timothy McCormick, and his partner were killed in that crash. It was a tremendous personal loss to me. He was a friend. He was a colleague. The entire furry community paused for a moment. Not only the furry community, but I watched on the news. This was not just a furry. This was not just an ambulance attendant. This was a remarkable young man. When he passed away, the news circulated through Indianapolis. They brought his body to the church in an ambulance draped with black crepe. And I watched on the news as the entire city of Indianapolis came out and lined the parade route to say their final goodbyes to a very gallant and very caring young man who, incidentally, also happened to be a furry. The mayor of Indianapolis postponed a very important speech because he didn't want it to detract from what was going on that day. His body was then flown to Staten Island, his home. I attended the funeral. I had to wait in line two and a half hours to pay my respects. So large was the number of people who turned out to say farewell to a man who was well-respected, well-loved, a very brave, gallant fellow, this furry. So the next time you run into one of these furry haters who want to call you names or say things about you, show them the video footage of the entire city of Indianapolis stopping to salute this man on his final journey and then you look at the eye and you tell him to go fuck themselves. for a day and then just kick him right out. Because, I'm going to repeat this story. He gave me permission to do this. He, uh, older man, salesman. He's got a, a seven-year-old girl and a five-year-old boy. And he said one day they came down for school. He was making breakfast that morning. And um, they came down and he asked the seven-year-old girl, what do you want for breakfast this morning? And she said, Dad, I want some fucking pancakes. <laughs> and her dad grabbed her, turned her over his knee, spanked her until she cried, and sent her right upstairs to her room. <laughs> the little five-year-old was sitting there looking like, what the hell just <laughs> So he tried to compose himself, and he says to the five-year-old boy, okay, what do you want for breakfast? And he said, I don't want no fucking pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> Stories like that make me want a child every now and then. <laughs> for a couple hours, and then get right back on. I don't care that they're scared. That doesn't bother me at all. After all they put us through, they deserve to have some of that. Can I bite them on the ass? When you think about it, if you really think, we're kind of a product of their short-sighted cruelty and wickedness. We, kind of, we wouldn't be the way we are if it wasn't for them. Uh, uh, uh. They're, they're wandering through a hotel of their own ghosts. They should be scared a little bit. I, I don't know. But you know what? Scared isn't good enough. I don't think scared is not good enough for me. I want to see some therapy bills. <laughs> we can do this, folks. We can make the therapy bills happen. We can. I've seen, okay, theoretically, what if? I've seen these twin fursuers. Every now and then you'll see twins, right? Sometimes we'll see triplets, but we'd have to do this with twins. What if 
we took a couple of those twin first hitters and put them in the hotel at the end of a hallway together. Oh. A bunch of hacked up bodies. Oh. Going, come play with us, human. Yeah. Forever. <laughs> Shame therapy. <laughs> what if, this would take a little work, what if we got together and built a group of bunny fursuits with no skin. Wow. Huge eyes, big dick, no skin. <laughs> and whenever somebody walked into the hotel with a fur coat on, we could send them over with a little sign that says, we are cold. <laughs> Shame therapy. <laughs> what if we went down to the restaurant and got a big steak, big ass juicy steak, and had a cow fursuit get birth to it right in the lobby. Oh! Right in front of the moo, moo, poo! <laughs> and then all the other fursuits could go, still birth, and jump on it and start ripping it apart. <laughs> Chain therapy! Dude, 
eyes are staring at me. <laughs> yes, I know I have nice legs. Thank you. Okay. It's time to line up for the parade. <laughs> okay, I have not stepped outside of this hotel since I have arrived here. Now, last night I checked the temperature um, and it was 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So, I'm going to take a quick step out and uh, see how it feels now. Okay, I'm going back in. <laughs> it is freezing out there. Hey guys, um, yeah, it's Saturday. Uh, it is about um, to be the first suit parade. As you have noticed, I am not in suit because uh, Loki is not here. Um, he's been going through a refurbishment, and uh, just today I got an email saying that he's ready. <laughs> kind of bad timing. Um, so Loki is done with his refurbishment, but unfortunately, um, a bit too late to get over here. So. Um, uh, for the first time in uh, quite a while, I'm not going to be suiting. Um, uh, but uh, I did uh, get a, uh, a sketch done. Let's see if I can bring it out. Yeah, and it's stuck to my uh, programming. Uh, just give me one second. Here we go. Jelly old fella, is he? Yeah, that's actually uh, done by the fabulous Roxy Cat. Um, yeah, I just uh, love his work. So, uh, I figured I'd get a commission from him. Um, well, what else do we got going on today? Let me look at the schedule. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, we got that panel is a brony of furry. Um, which uh, is a good question, because um, I have been going through my critical thinking class, and um, this is kind of a good one for me to, to work on. <laughs> um, what else do we got? Um, uh, later tonight, we got Whose Line Is It Anyway, which is, uh, I love this show. Uh, so you will get to see that uh, a little bit later tonight. Um, until then, i got to find something to do. I'll see you guys later. I love you too. You should stand in floats. I saw the first year they went that way. They went into the executive suite. And then I got to Nicole's. I literally thought you could hang out.
Said music video of Fluttershy doing the really deep <laughs> voice. I think something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's actually not skits here. It's the one who introduced me to it. And at first, I'm like, you know what? I am not ever going to see that. Whatever. You know, I just completely blew it off until a little bit later. I was like, you know, I was curious. I want to see. What the heck? I get. What do I have to lose? About 22 minutes of my time. About. Eight episodes later, I realized I gotta get to bed. I got work in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it blowing up on Fur Affinity, and I was like, "What the heck? Why is for? Uh, why are ponies just everywhere all of a sudden?" And everyone's talking about the show and how awesome it is, and I'm like, "It's like a girls' show, right?" <laughs> and I, I, I was hesitant to actually watch it. Do you think the popularity you may have also spent because of the furry fandom? Like people and other furry fans are saying, "Hey, look, a show." about, you know, ponies, and they're like, oh, this is There terrible. have been shows like that, to, you know, since forever. I mean, the 90s was full of them. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, SWAT Cats, um, you know, just the, uh, what was the one with the dogs in spacesuits? There we go. I mean, like, the Rogue show is, like, a great example, and there is so much furry art for that. Um, but, like, anthropomorphic, like, very, not animal, but very human-ish animals, in cartoons have been around for forever, and um, although it, I don't think it really has been that much of a um, girly type show before now, um, there hasn't been a lot of that in the girl category. But again, that's getting the you know the gender stereotyping. Yeah, up until now, all the all the girl shows have been rather uh, stereotypical, hollow. Just Hey, I grew up on those stereotypical Hollow Girl shows. Very short <laughs> they were too. Stop me before I say it. Because we know it. She's all shiny. Rainbow bright. Yeah. Rainbow bright. Sailor. Hey, no, don't talk Sailor. Sailor, what? She was my side. But if they would have to be for a target audience, um, uh, perhaps it, it, it was um, just someone who just come across it and just happened to like it, ju just uh, with the uh, creators not intending to go for that audience. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, the Bony fandom, it kind of exploded or whatever, you know, yeah. due to, you know, internet and everything we have nowadays. Even me personally, I was actually a big fan of the Powerpuff Girls. I loved Bubbles. 
<laughs> who is also, you know, voice by Terry Strong, voice of Twilight Sparkle. And, you know, I just thought it was weird, you know, I basically kind of watched it or whatever, you know, pretty much what my little sisters did, because I didn't want to, you know, it to be known, you know, hey, I like Powerpuff Girls and Show Filled Girls. It's actually about, when they aired the 10th anniversary episode, I found that on this, you know, video game forum I was a member of, that there's actually a ton of them that like it. I think it's going to blow me out of the water. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I want to bring up, like, I, I don't really, like, a lot of people believe that, you know, I, it was a certain subgroup that latched on to the My Little Pony and made it popular. But I think it was more a combination of, you know, a lot of us grew up with the all the voice actors on the show. Yeah. So we we know their work. Tara when, Tara Strong was on the Powerpuff Girls, and she also did Rugrats. Uh, yeah, I mean she joined up later. But yeah, Harley Quinn. Lauren Faust was a, one of the main She's characters for Powerpuff Girls. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say, want to bring up that you know we grew up with all the voice actors on the show. Well, getting back away from the you know show itself and onto like you know how it got into the freeze like I think uh, there's. Definitely an attitude still um, within the furry fan. There are a lot of furries that just aren't into it, and that's fine. But you see definitely a lot of um, furries seeming uncomfortable with how many um, bronies are starting to show up to what was their thing, um, this, and this is you know their realm, and and that's great. And it is you know in a way it is getting invaded, but it's partly and so I think in some way it's a lot of bronies discovering what furry actually is and either right, right, right. learning whether or not it's for them and learning to respect it and accept it. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you can draw a parallel. Say, do you think that's hard? Do you think that's kind of studious on the uh, both or either of the uh, brony fandom and the furry fandom? We've got ours, screw you. Well, in a sense, yes, because I mean, uh, all these fandoms should definitely be, you know, wanting to preach, you know, acceptance. And anyone that wants to know more about, you know, what, you know, other people are into, they should be encouraged to do so. Um, it's probably the same way that people should, you know, look at a, a church. You know, people go in there wanting to be accepted and not, you know, shunned for being different or being new. You know, it's, it should be a, a sanctuary of sorts. I want to hear about your parallel. Yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry. Okay. Well, I'm, trying, I'm basically trying to draw a parallel between bronies and furry fandom. In in a sense, basically, both have this whimsical fantasy nature about it. Yes. Um, and of course, you're going to express yourself within each, but it's very, very similar. So you have, they're they're the same, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. They really, this is really embarrassing. Hey. <laughs> 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 sorry. Phone calls too. Sorry. <laughs> Anyway, uh, lost my train of thought. Um, that that was basically it. Uh, they are the same, uh, mm -hmm. in a sense, <laughs> because uh, the people that you find, the uh, the people that you meet through either Brony fandom or furry fandom, it's it's all about love. Everybody like is automatically your best friend if you have something in common. Right? Yeah. No and matter how you look at it, we like things that are very similar. Right. It might be something as big in general as furry. Or it might be something specific, like My Little Pony, or you know whatever TV show you like. It can, you know, they were talking about specific fandoms versus something that's a bit more generalized. Uh, I mean, you don't, uh, you don't just go to a Dragon Ball Z con or a Naruto con. It's an anime convention, and that's people who like specific things, but they're all in a general genre. Well, it's kind of like you know, uh, with furry, there's the word MLP. I guess it doesn't really matter. Uh, People like it because they may or may not like certain aspects of different characters from each. You know, there's a, I consider myself a furry. Uh, I'm not into MLP. I've never watched it, so I don't know. Uh, but basically, there's a lot of aspects in the furry community that don't interest me, I don't care for, or I don't relate to. But, you know, I mean, we both, or, you know, kind of just decide, okay, we'll just pick and choose what we want, and we pretty much throw the rest away, and that's what makes everybody like what they like, but yeah, we're I still all furries. I feel the same being you know, a brony community. There are things about being a brony I don't like. I, I figure, yeah, I, if I don't like something that somebody, like somebody figures okay for me, furry is spiritual, I don't feel that way, well, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. Yeah, it's like, you know, 
like what you like, but then, you know, in the end, we all came together and, you know, at MFF here that, you know, we all basically have something about this we like and we all want to go together for it. Yeah, I just throw this on because uh, it's fun. I enjoy doing it. Yeah, I mean, like that's you said, that's the depth of it. Like you said, you never really seen her or whatever, and you know what? My, it's your personal opinion or whatever. I really don't give a crap. <laughs> there are plenty of people that are going to try to shove it down your throats, but that's going to happen with not just this, but you know, just about any other specific show fandom. How many? I mean, I remember being a teenager and hating certain rock bands because my friends would shove them down my throat. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same way that you know, bronies are treated MLP or you know, people who like anything. If you like something, you want to share it, but sometimes we're a bit too eager to do so. <laughs> kind of like those people that knock on your door trying to sell religion. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Jehovah's Witness. Mormon Jesus. Doctor Who. Jesus. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. I might not have a strong standpoint with this, but bronies make the pony videos, and they equip, like, they have their own pony, OC, and they have, like, themselves talking or singing or doing whatever and like that just makes me think that a furry is a furry. Oh yeah, that's very much of you know yeah. furry culture because well at least that's something that furries were doing long before furries well, were no, doing it. There's no furry songs that I know of. Like there's no mm -hmm. Oh, just they're the around. What? Uh, what? 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 Oh, there's, there's a few too. Like, <laughs> 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 I'm not big on the Bernard. music in these communities, so you guys would have to know that. Bernard puts out like 30 albums a year. Okay. So yeah, I don't like, listen. I don't listen to a lot of music in any of these fandoms. He does like 12 different genres of music, all under different pseudonyms. Yeah. A lot of like and Blender, Mega Ren, or is it something else? Well, I mean, they, they, yeah, there are, I think that that happens too, is that, you know, they're making things based on what they love, and be it music, be it cartoons, be it their own characters, um, and the character thing like that's very common in the Brony fandom now, and I don't think how many people do that, realizing that that definitely is furry behavior. I mean, and not, I was going to say this earlier, because it's something he said, it's like, not all bronies have an OC. You know, some people just watch the show to watch the show. I mean, but me, I got a little bit more into it and everything, and, you know, I went through some names or whatever, some designs. I mean, people call my OC a Fluttershy ripoff, and sort of the name is, too, it but... Totally is a pellet swap. That's so crazy. Hmm? It was made with love, that's all that matters. I mean, well, it's not a carbon copy. Yes, it is heavily inspired. But, you know, I mean, it's my name in this fandom. Well, I mean, think about how many wolves are named Xander right now. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. Yeah. There's trouble. I'm well, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Like, there are, there are trends in the freak. I've going around the con, I've been hearing people saying that, Wolves are in, foxes are out. Foxes are in, wolves are out. It's <laughs> like there's debates on these things. I, I, I never I've never seen this. I've 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 seen this. And again, that's going beyond just Brides and Furries. Every kind of fandom um, has debates about what thing is better than the other. Um, you know, it's Star Trek versus Star Wars in that sense, then. Yeah, that sounds like Deja Vu of the panel who came from next door. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that thing too. Yes? I would say that bronies can be furries if the reason that they like brony is a similar reason to why they're in the furry community. Furry community is essentially, and I don't want to boil this down to an exact science because we are more diverse than a 64 box of Crayola. It's about yeah. And that is a lot of great with the built in crayon sharpener. The thing is, like, a lot, it seems like a lot of times furry boils down to. Well, the story could be told with people, but it's animal people, and that makes it better. So, I mean, for the same reason, like, if My Little Pony somehow it, it appeals to people, and I, I'm apathetic about the show, it's a well-made show. Uh, my, my level of enjoyment is inversely proportional to my level of sobriety. 
Well, it sounds to me like that you're saying, um, since it's told by animals because instead of humans, animals. Uh, oh, because Equestria girls, yeah. uh, oh, they all became human, and they were, do, they were humans doing human lessons, but it just so happens that they're a lot of birds. I heard people got to be I personally love them. Who got the same So it. I don't know. It, it could be valid. It could. It could be invalidated by the sense that they have had. Uh, they even though they attached the name My Little Pony to it, it was humans doing human things. So I'm, even though they were odd humans, and it was just a way for them to try to take money from Monster High. <laughs> well, in the end, I mean, this is, uh, furry fandom isn't something that's about finances, whereas you know, My Little Pony is a television show made by a company who wants to sell toys. They are in it for the bottom line. Um, they don't care if the show is loved by, you know, even just you know, well, they care if it's loved by the little girls, but they don't give a crap about us. Um, we are not their bread and butter yet. Uh, <laughs> what you're touching on is kind of like what you were saying earlier about how instead of having like a Dragon Ball Z con, you have general anime cons. Furry is a little bit more insulated from the money grubbing corporations just because we're pulling in so many different sources. You got Star Fox, Disney, uh, SWAT Cats, uh, Thundercats, what, what, you know, there's. Dozens of different, you know, dozens of different things that we're pulling from across all the original content. So that that kind of insulates us a bit because it's such a mix. While yeah. my li the Brony fandom is just pulling from a single source. And that exactly. So much saying, more we have our the, the cons for Bronies are just for My Little Pony. Whereas if you you could fit it into let's say a category with all '80s cartoons. Let's say you had a convention that's like Transformers and GI Joe and My <laughs> Little Pony and all that meets together, and it would probably be in that category. But instead, you have My Little Pony is its own conventions, and there were 36 of them this year. What the heck? Um, but there, and it's simply because uh, I think if you were to try, if you whenever it's tried to be looped in with other particular communities, it's hard to figure out which community you log, you put it into, and each of those communities seems to try to shy away from it, because not all of them are into it. You could put Mix of My Little Pony into furry you know, conventions. It's tried to be mixed into anime conventions. It shows up at comic conventions, and it, does, and it can fit in any one of those somewhat. Um, I mean, because anime conventions have less, have, in the last few years, have become less just about Japanese animation, but a bit more animation in general with the rise of things like Adventure Time um, and, you know, all these other American cartoons that are developing their own fandoms. Yeah, Avatar. I mean, the, those things, I mean, there are, how many Avatar conventions are there? I'm sure there's at least one, but I don't think there's, you know, a, more than a dozen. James Cameron or Nickelodeon? Oh God! I hope not the James Cameron. I want to forget the James Cameron. But okay, but then in that, that's one that like is that furry? At least it's not Emma Shyamalan's Avatar. Apparently, animals. Exactly. Yeah, I asked that question before, and most of the responses I got was no, um, mainly because uh, it was on an alien planet. But I, I, I had that was Second uh, Life, the movie. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, they they had animal characteristics. They had, they had the ears, the tail. They they had the, the cat-like yes, sounds. That it, it all sounded furry to me. But, so it was like a slight movement in the beginning, but that kind of got knocked out by overzealous um, Avatar fans. But now the people are here momentarily, and the body paint and everything has like gone. Yeah, flesh and the there. Yeah. So is that the reason why there are, I mean, from, from what I seem to understand is that there are furries that don't like bronies, is that just because some bronies are just too overzealous and... Well, yeah, well, you're going to have people that are overzealous about anything they like. I don't know if it's so much that, but I think that there are, um, and forgive me if I'm judging anyone that has this opinion, but um, I think that there's plenty of furries that feel invaded. Um, like they, f um, right. and, um, protective of their culture. Um, probably in the same sense that you know, um, there are people. There, there are still going to be people in this country that don't want to accept homosexuality. They don't want it to be a part of culture. They don't want it to be allowed. They want it to constantly be shunned and kept separate. Um, but it's not always up to them what people are going to like. 
you know, um, and there are going to be plenty of people that, you know, like, um, you know, My Little Pony and happen to be furry, and since there's a good amount of them, it's going to show up at furry conventions. I mean, it, not saying that all furries have to start liking My Little Pony, but so much of them do that it's kind of hard to say, no, we don't want to see any pony around this community at all. You do also have the bronies that do not like furries for the same reason. They just feel like, oh, you know, this is my thing. I don't want other people, you know, you just have people who don't like either way. You have people who just hate both bronies and furries equally for pretty much the same reason. They think, oh, oh they're just the animal obsessed freaks. I see a difference between that, actually. I see a difference between bronies not liking furries and furries not liking bronies simply because I think when the bronies that don't like furry, tend to have a misconception about it still. There's plenty of people that have, you know, seen it and are around it, but, you know, it's just not for them. But there are plenty of people that have that, that still just assume that furry is what, um, what that social stigma behind furry is. They assume that that's reality and that's truth. Um, yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah, and, and same thing. Um, um, just like uh, people have feelings about um, Okay, so they, they have uh, their definition, they have strict definitions of, of what is acceptable. Um, and some people seem to, ha seem to have it here, like um, the most basic definition of furry we have here is uh, just animals with um, anthropomorphic um, 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 characteristics. Um, but but see, people seem to take that uh, and make it more strict. It seems like everybody has, has a different definition. I was gonna say, I, I think some of the backlash against bronies from the furry community, I think some of it might just be resp uh, caused by, you know, the kind of hipster attitude that's pervasive in a lot of subcultures where it's like, well, geez, you know, if, if nobody knows about something uh, and, I, and I could be the only person that likes it, then I'll like it and I can be cool for liking something nobody else does. But if it becomes popular, well, geez, you know, now I gotta hate it because everybody. Well, the you. outsider attitude—that's been around forever. It's you know, it's sell or selling out or whatever. It's you yeah, know, liking. Uh, I like so and so rock band, but I started hating them once they got famous. So and, I, but, I and that can and well and that can be argued and it cannot be argued. Uh, if you want to go down that route, let's go with the idea that Nirvana is one of the greatest rock bands of all time, and their two greatest albums were made after the fact that they were richer than God. Um, MTV Unplugged and In Utero are their best albums they ever made, and that was after they had made more money than you could ever count. Yeah, and I remember back then people were saying that. All right, everyone, it's a Saturday night here in Chicago. Um, I think, um, I've mentioned that they made some uh, furry uh, uh, type drinks uh, just for this weekend. Um, there's, they even got stuff in the coffee shop. So I thought it would be appropriate if I got the Dragon Tail Mate. What that is, uh, this has uh, gingerbread and vanilla flavors with a cinnamon topping on it. Yeah, and it tastes very good, actually. So, so I'm loving Chicago. Um, let's see, uh, they had the variety show coming up. Um, and then, um, oh yeah, tonight we have a Whose Line Is It Anyway, um, my favorite uh, improv show, uh, so we'll be getting some footage of that. And um, we'll also be doing a, um, a game of Cards Against Humanity, <laughs> hilarious game. Um, so, in the meantime, uh, we'll just explore around, um, and I'll see you guys a little bit later.
Are you a bouncy bunny? Yes, he is. Sit with her so you should not alone. 
Chicago suburb. Actually, the high school that the movie was filmed in is actually now a police headquarters. Somewhere in sorry, suburban Chicago. Sorry, sorry. But, um, hey, let me see a, uh, a quick show of hands here. Uh, raise your paw if you grew up in the 80s. Woo! Okay, all right. Now raise your paw if you never grew up. <laughs> okay, that's good, that's good. You know, no matter what decade you come from, The Breakfast Club is the quintessential teenage movie. It's a story about five teenagers who spend a Saturday in, de in detention together, and they realize that even though they have a lot of things that make them very much different, they have a lot of things that make them very much the same. And I hope you enjoy my version of The Breakfast Club. It's fresh. It's unavoidable. Just happens. What happens? When you grow up, your heart dies. Not me. Ever.
Nighttime, um, and I'm afraid my time is up here. But um, I had a great time here in Chicago. Um, yeah, thanks to everyone here at uh, Midwest for Fest um, and all the hotel staff. Yeah, I'm here um, at the Hyatt. So um, I'm looking forward to this. As for my next con, um, I am that's still up in the air. Um, so I will I'll let you know uh, when um, uh, that's going to be. Right now, I gotta take uh, more trains back and then fly back into North Carolina. So, as much as I hate to leave here, I have to. This is always the hardest part of um, any year for con weekend leaving. <laughs> All right, um, I'll see you back in North Carolina's bike path logging out. I just gotta catch this. This. It is an awesome view. We have a plane that's about to fly right over us. Yeah, this is how close we are to O'Hare Airport. It's a wonder that I sleep through the night with these planes going through. Here it comes. Uh, that one looks like um, an Airbus. Yeah, that, that looks like an Airbus. Yeah, we're in the rain and we're pretty quiet. <laughs> okay, I'm done.